Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 422nd episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have Mr. Stu Hynek. This is an interesting dude. You may or may not know this, but uh, you're going to be finding out today for sure. I have been uh, an aspiring, um, what do you call it, like undercover uh, budding artist. I've always liked drawing, even as a kid. And um, I have been working on the Diary of a Wimpy Salesman for far too long. But, you know, I dabble. So um, I was really interested. I ran across Stu. He is the founder of Cartoonists. Uh, but he has written some books that are quite interesting. One of them is called How to Get a Meeting with Anyone, The Untapped Selling Power of Contact Marketing. And we get into that. We get into the um, another book that he's got is uh, Drawing Attention, How to Unleash the Incredible Power of Cartoons in Marketing, Advertising, Sales Promotion, Job Search, VIP Contact Campaigns, and more. So when I saw his work with, uh, with cartoons, you know, it piqued my interest because that's what they do. We, even as a kid, you probably jumped right to the cartoons. Uh, as an adult, you may still do that. But, um, you know, that intrigued me just because of my own hobby and passion. But how he ties it to sales, how to get a meeting with anyone. I was like, oh, yeah, we got to talk. Uh, and you're in for a treat. He's uh, a great guest, uh, knowledgeable, smart dude. You are going to get a lot out of this. Um, two things I've been working on behind the scenes. This podcast, this episode is coming out a couple days late. I've been working on a lot of things. Uh, the new year's here, and I have been I've been doubling and tripling, quadrupling down uh, this last month. And uh, it's time. In uh, in April, I turned fifty. It's like holy crap. And you know, thirty didn't bother me. You know, Twenty one, of course, didn't bother me. Uh, Forty didn't bother me. Fifty, I don't know. I don't know. I'll get through it. But um, it's like, hey, I got to get some stuff done. You know, I've had some goals. And I, I've got a solid. Uh, solidify those goals uh, and make bigger goals. And so around those, one is how to help more people. And that's doubling down on the implementors.com. It's a free Facebook group. Um, So I'm starting to put more content there, answer more questions. So come engage. All right, it's free. Carry on the, the, the dialogue from here, even though it's more like a, it's a monologue right now, a dialogue with the guests, but I can't dialogue with you. So if you've got questions, bring them there, okay? Uh, and the other I've been working on frantically, um, you know, I was talking about doing the uh, the two days in Texas, uh, but that's months away. And I had another guest on uh, this week, actually, uh, Johnny Cooper out of the UK, and uh, his episode will go live, uh, number 426. But a uh, super smart guy, and he gave me some ideas, and it, it lit a fire under something I used to have and I just realized in all of this, I, I had too, I was spread too thin. I had too many irons in the fire. I had too many offerings. And I've just been clean in the house. And it feels good. And it feels bad, too, because I realized how much house cleaning I have to do internally, you know, with my own digital marketing, with the, own, with the offers that I have. And um, so I'm really tightening those up. So it's, even though it's a daunting task, it's, I mean, I've had more energy and focus uh, and excitement than I've had in a long time. So along those lines, um, to get some intimate, intense, effective training for a small group, you know, I don't want to do big uh, events because it's, I don't think it moves the needle enough. Uh, I'm happy to do those, like to springboard into something else, but uh, this group, I, I've had the idea, I've had the name, I've had the logo for a couple of years. Uh, it's called The Five. Uh, but the structure is what I didn't have. How to really lay this out. And talking with Johnny, it just kind of opened up some ideas. So I am starting The Five. Uh, you can go to, to thefive.us. And it's literally for five people. And it is a six-week program. We are going to start uh, the first week of February, that, uh, that first Thursday. I think it's the 6th. And we're going to meet six times virtually. We're going to have accountability partners. We'll rotate through uh, each week so you get to know each other. Uh, and I am one of the accountability partners, so we'll be kind of rotating through. Uh, so we'll always have someone to talk to privately. 
you know, that one-on-one, there's going to be a private group just for members of the five. And then as we have future, basically what I'm going to do is do this for six weeks. We're going to conclude with two days live um, here at my place in SoCal. It may even be at my house. It just depends on what my wife says. Uh, but it'll be here in Southern California. A friend of mine has a co-working uh, space I can rent. Uh, but it'll be nice. The weather's always good. We'll go wine tasting, maybe do some jujitsu. But we're going to spend two days together tying everything together and launching you into your next venture, right, with more confidence, with more skills. And so when you're the first one coming through this, this will be at the lowest price because uh, I'm going to do this for six weeks. I'll basically take two weeks off and do it again. Uh, my goal is to get through, uh, what, what do I have on the board? One, two, three, four, five, six of them this year. That would be fantastic. Uh, but each time it'll get, uh, it'll go up a few hundred bucks and it's still uh, super cheap for what you get for, you know, six uh, pri- semi-private calls, private group. Uh, you're going to get a private call with me as well. You'll have unlimited access to me. So if you need help with something, I'll be there for you. Uh, and then two days in person, okay, starting the first week of February. So head on over to the5.us, lock in your spot, be one of the inaugural members, okay? Uh, the two days um, in here in California, we will solidify on our first call with uh, the five because I'm flexible that week. I'm flexible most weeks. It's a nice thing of owning your own business. Uh, and I'm going to teach you how to do this. But... Um, so we'll solidify that, you know, the exact dates that work best for everyone, but it'll be uh, six weeks later. Okay. So check that out. The five dot us. If that's not for you, then the implementors.com is free. Come on over. Now let's bring on Stu. Stu Heineck, founder of some crazy cool things. Cartoonist.org, uh, author of how to get a meeting with anyone, which I'm going to put you to the test, man. We're going to, we're going to test this oh, all yeah. the way from an Island in Washington. Welcome to Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? That's right. Thank you, Wes. Good to be here. Did you really sleep in your car <laughs> at the airport just to go to a meeting? Are, are you one of those you know, kind of old school guys? Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I'll tell you, I did it just last week. It just happened. <laughs> I'm amazed you know about it. <laughs> you know, except that I showed you the, the, the video on YouTube. But yeah, you know, so I live on an island and normally I wouldn't sleep in my car in the parking lot. But I live, I live on an island. It's beautiful. I'm up in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, this place is gorgeous. And in fact, we should have done the interview there or here. I mean, you know, but anyway, oh, that's sort of, that's it well, behind now me. Now you tell me. All right. Yeah. Let so, me hit you know, pause. next time. Let me hit pause and I'll do a video like you did of me traveling yeah. to get to your island. There you go. Yeah. So, but so, you know, I, so I, I booked this um, six o'clock flight. And it's, you know, on United, you go from, from this really cool little airport that we have that's an alternative to SeaTac. So it's called uh, Painfield. It's you fly from Painfield to, um, to Denver and then to Minneapolis. Well, the thing is, I booked a six o'clock flight in the morning. And then I realized, well, I better check the ferry schedule. This was the night before. I'm saying, I better check the ferry schedule. What's the first, what's the first ferry out? And it was a 440 ferry. Well, that meant that I would have, you know, it's, it would have meant that I would have missed my flight by about 20 minutes. I couldn't take that. And that is if everything was, you know, if everything was on time, but, and that's, there's never a guarantee. So I would have missed my flight and I thought, okay, what do I do? God, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go to a hotel for four hours. So I just thought, okay, okay. I'm going out, taking the 1230, the last ferry of the night, um, Sunday night. And it was a Monday morning flight. And I just slept in the, in the parking lot for a few hours or well, four hours. <laughs> and let oh, me tell you, it's a horrible way to start a trip. It's awful. Oh, it's like I awful. I like my sleep, and I don't sleep well yeah. in, on planes, on vehicles, in vehicles. So, um, yeah, kudos to you for doing it. I mean, you one of your videos I saw on your YouTube channel is whatever it takes, right? Yeah. Well, you know, so I, I mean, I was going to to meetings starting uh, eight o'clock Tuesday morning in Minneapolis. And hey, I was there five minutes early by design. I was, I'm right on time. That's, I think that's so important. You know, look, we're talking about getting meetings. So if you get someone to agree to a meeting, don't be late for crying out loud. Be on yeah. time. Yeah. I know. So your book, though, I, I, we got introduced through some mutual friends and, and I was checking out the things you're doing. I mean, so people listening to this, how to get a meeting with anyone, 
they're going to say, yeah, yeah, whatever, dude. Um, but you do, I mean, you back it up, right? And the, the things I've seen you send in the mail, I've never, ever seen. How, how did you come up with that idea? Oh, man. Well, um, if you're talking about the cartoons, I'm, you know, I've got this, I, I just have to say, I have this bizarre background or co combinations of backgrounds. Um, I, I'm a marketer. I mean, that's, that's my education from USC. Um, and of course I write books, but I'm also one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists. And I've been a cartoonist my whole career, uh, not always with the Wall Street Journal, but one of the things I discovered really early on was that if, uh, I just, that, that cartoons are, are, they're an amazing device. So for example, magazines and newspapers have been running readership surveys to find out what gets read and remembered um, in, the, in the publications. And what they've found is that cartoons are almost always the best read and remembered parts. That's amazing, right? I mean, everything in a magazine is, is supposed to be memorable and get your attention, but it's cartoons that always walk away with the top marks. And then the other thing about, if you think about the nature of humor, it's always about telling, it's always about a truth or revealing a truth with a twist, right? So, I mean, that's why we, it is, it's, the thing is, it's utter truth. That's why when we find something funny, we're laughing at, a, a lot of times, you know, you know, you've been through this, we, we've all been through this, you, you're laughing, but you're still gasping for air, you say, oh my God, that's so true, right? Yeah. So, in a cartoon, um, we, we sort of steer the use of them, and we usually new clients will say, put my logo in there somewhere, get my brand in there, and that's not what you do. What we do is we steer the message, the, the point of agreement, that truth that we're re revealing in a twist in such a way that it supports, let's say, the, the rationale for why we should be talking or what we should be talking about. So, um, so those, though, I, I've used those as devices to get through to people my whole career, and I've reached presidents and prime ministers and celebrities and countless CEOs and, and um, other C-level executives and top decision makers. I mean, it's almost like shooting fish in a barrel. Now, I don't, I, the thing is, I, I don't, I don't get through to everybody. I mean, not, that doesn't, that doesn't happen, but, um, but we get pretty darn close and there are ways to actually pump that up to to hundred percent response rates. Yeah. Well, you get through to the people worth getting through to. So if they say no to that, they just, they're not human, man. They're some kind of robot. <laughs> they're, they're like a Terminator, right? They, they just stay away from them. Well, I'm not sure about that. I, I think some of them will require some, some uh, persistence after all. Hey, but we're, if you're in sales, that's part, you know, it's like your middle name, right? You got to be uh, persistent. Man, those, they're robots. Just, just run away. It's got to keep, <laughs> just say no. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, there is, there is something to that. If you don't appreciate that you just got a cartoon from one of the wall street journal cartoonists and that didn't move the dial for you. Okay. <laughs> you know, what kind of a client will this be? So what's but, between a comic and a cartoon? A comic and a cartoon. Well, um, um, yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, cartooning is, is, is broken down into a lots of little sort of, um, subcategories. Political cartoonists don't know single panel gag cartoonists. And those are the ones that you would find in, in the New Yorker and the Wall Street Journal, for example. Um, but I don't know any political cartoonists. And comics are, are serial drawings, I mean, like comic books, you know, so you read it and there, there's many, many drawings, you follow them, there's a sequence. In, in single panel gag cartoons, there's one cartoon. So just, I mean, just one drawing and one caption underneath. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm doing. But you know, if you want, if you, if you want to picture what this is, it's, it's what you see in the New Yorker and the, in the wall street journal. Right. Yeah. And you know, they like a, a single panel, um, you know, illustration, it doesn't always have to be funny. Huh? I mean, it can be insightful just to, to make, get your point across. Well, actually I disagree. They should be funny. And, and the humor is insight. And does that make sense? Sure. Because again, you know, you just, if you're laughing, I've, I can tell you that if I send you a cartoon and you go, ha, that's great, then you just got my point. You internalized my point, the, the point of agreement that I wanted to plant. Okay. And, and that point of agreement is always an insight. You know, right. it's always some statement that you can agree with. I mean, because that's a, that's a, that's a point of agreement. But, but so, so the cartoon actually is insight. And, and that's funny because, 
You know, I was just having a conversation with someone, a, a, a potential client in New York. I don't know if we're doing anything or not, but, but we were talking about, well, the, the, it's a big consulting firm and they were talking about how, what, what they're, what they'd like to have. They're, they're talking about giving a speech to their junior um, uh, associates. So new, new to the rank, their ranks of consultants. And so we're talking about really, can you use contact marketing, which is what I do. Can you use contact marketing to deliver insights? And I'm saying, well, that's, that is what it, I mean, that's what we use to get meetings. They're, they're always something if people, we want people saying, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I, that makes sense. But also, man, I love the way you think. So those are insights. And, and so it's, I think really what we're talking about are insightful ways to, to, um, to convey insights. Right. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest component of making that impact? So you send this big oversized illustration, right? And is it, is it the mere fact that it's big and stands out? It's 3d mail. Like, is that, is that, 50%, 50%, is that 90%? And then the message kind of carries it home? Or does the um, message does it have to be like perfect, you know, as well as the, you know, the big oversized piece showing up, you know, it's, it's unavoidable, right? They got to they gotta yeah. open it and see what the heck that is. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so if we're talking about using cartoons, and by the way, I want to make the point that, that cartoon, or sorry, contact marketing is not about just using cartoons. That's sort of my... My approach, or, or one approach, we'll say, but there are many. Um, so, but but having said that, here's what happens with my with my cartoon uh, contact system. We start with a with a, a call to the to the executive assistant, and what we're saying is, or what we say to them is, "Hi, I'm, let's say if, I, if I'm sending mine, I'm just saying, hi, my name is Stu. I'm a um, um, I'm one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists, and I'm sending a print of one of my cartoons." And it's about your boss. Well, usually the, the assistant is by then is saying, what, really? <laughs> That's pretty cool. So, uh, so we, and if it's, or if it's one of my, one of my uh, clients reps, they'll say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm calling because I'm sending a print of a cartoon by one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists and it's about your boss. So it's about the same thing. And, and the assistant will say, wow, really? Okay. Yeah. So if you wouldn't mind, can I send you an email with my contact details and just, I'll, I'll just send you a, just because I want it to be a surprise to your, to your boss, but not to you. So I'd love to just share all this with you in a, in, in a form you can, you can refer to. So, no, oh, yeah, no problem. Here's my email address. Here's how you spell my name. Great. So then the email goes out. Uh, oftentimes there's a cartoon card. So another, another personalized cartoon. The cartoons are always about the recipients. And so now there's a card about the, about the executive assistant and a card thanking them for, um, for their help on the phone. Um, so that comes in even before the big board does. And then when you have the tracking information, you get back to them one more time. By the time all this happens, they're quarterbacking from the inside your campaign. So they're, they're, they're making sure that the, that the executive gets it. But now really directly to the point of your question, um, the cartoon should be, yes, it should be funny. It should always be funny because that's the source of, of insight. We also want to, target that cartoon um, so that it means something to the recipient. And you know, a lot of times if you're sending a cartoon, let's say to a CEO, a good bet is to send a cartoon to them that commemorates in some way, in some sort of backhanded way, their success. So it might be the scene might be at a competitor's office and they're, they're, trying, they're, they're confounded by how well you're doing, but you're, they're doing it in a way that you, you laugh, right? I mean, there's a twist and, and you laugh. So it becomes something that people keep, they want to keep, I think it becomes an heirloom to their careers, actually. Right. So that's a lot of value in it. I mean, you wouldn't want to send something about your your brand, for example. I mean, that's the Geico form of right. humor, which is to say, it's not there is no humor there, and it's because they focused on the wrong. They're focused on themselves instead of on on the re, each recipient of their message. But here we can focus on each recipient, and it becomes an heirloom to their careers. They love it. I mean, it's a cartoon about them. You know, it's about them being a. A, a big success in business, but in a really funny way. And, and so, but then you flip the thing over and, and what I can't even make it, my hands big enough, but they're 18 by 24 inches. Um, and they're in this sort of, mm, they're in this corrugated cardboard packaging that has cartoon art all over it. It looks like it's, it's something coming from a cartoon art gallery. 
So, so the size does have a lot of, I mean, that does have a lot of impact. It's right. huge. You know, in, in essence, it's a big postcard, you know, because on the other side, there's, a, there's all the branding and messaging from the sender to the recipient explaining who they are and why, why they want to meet and, and what the next steps are. And, and so you could send that as a postcard, I suppose, but it wouldn't have the same impact. Oh, for sure. It would have some impact, but, you know, we're making a big deal about this is a, this is a, a print of a cartoon by one of the Wall Street Journal or New Yorker cartoonists about your boss or about you. So there's a big production going on. There is a lot more production value going on there than just, let's say, direct, a piece of direct mail. And is each piece truly unique or do you ever recycle? Like just swap their name out and send another one? Oh man, good question. Because you know, oh, that's a really good question. I, I'll tell you why I think that's so good. Um, personalization, they, just the nature of personalization is changing. Um, so when I started out creating direct mail campaigns um, and you know, I, and I've, I've received two, uh, two hall of fame nominations for my work in direct mail you know, using cartoons, personalized cartoons, because people have treated those really very differently. But, you know, when, so when, when I was doing that, um, I, we create cartoons. I've got an image bank of about 1600 cartoons now that have data insertion points. They're written with data insertion points for first and last name. So all we need to know is your address and the correct spelling of your name. And we can, we can give you a great little experience. Because here's a cartoon by one of the, by a famous cartoonist, and it's about you. That's pretty cool, right? So, so there's that. But, but there's also another, and I would call that wide personalization because you could, you you know, if you have a database, you can send millions of them. You know, I mean, it's just, or you can send one, but you can certainly make it a very broad audience. Right. Um, they, there's another form of of personalization that's popped up. I think because of the just the ubiquity of of social media, and that is what I've called deep personalization in my, in my new book. Um, and deep personalization has to do with scraping profiles and finding out, or really, really creating a dossier on people. I mean, you can either scrape profiles or you can use services like seamless.ai, something like that. And you can get pretty quickly, you can get a dossier on someone. Um, so now you know who they are, what they like, what, you know, what some of the, th some of the things they're tweeting about or, or posting about. So you get a sense of what they're really interested in, what really, um, you know, I mean, if you, if you, uh, if you're going to send me something, you'd probably find uh, mentions of, of the flying cowboys. I love watching those guys on YouTube. This is those kinds of things. You find out the details like that, and then you do something or send something based on that or themed around that. Right. So that's, that's deep personalization. And the thing is, both of them are, both forms are, um, they're powerful. They have very different properties um, and limitations, uh, but also advantages. So, but, you know, if I'm going to send you a cartoon, or if I'm going to send 100 cartoons, so 100 CEOs, I don't need to know the names of, of their dogs or where they went to school or, I don't know, that they like to cook, any of those things. All I need to know is their first and last name and that, that there's a CEO and I can send a cartoon that will thrill them. But, right. um, but the other way would be to, you know, I do a lot of research and find out one guy, one, let's say one CEO really loves jet airplanes or old jets. And so th your gift to get through is a, is a, a, a ride in a MIG fighter. Right. That'll, you'll probably get through. I mean, that'll thrill them. So they're both diff very different forms of personalization and gifting, but they both work. So I know somebody's listening to this saying, well, that works for you. You're a, you can throw that name around the Wall Street Journal. I'm just some unknown dude. Uh, if I call an executive assistant, they're just going to hang up on me. Yeah. Like, what do I have to send them? And by the way, I can't draw. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Because I, I, again, I just want to make the point, you don't have to, this doesn't require that you be a cartoonist or that you're published in the Wall Street Journal. Um, <clears throat> none of that. But you know, so... <clears throat> I got to plug my books, I guess, a little bit. If you read How to Get a Meeting with Anyone, which is the book that came out in 2016, or the new one, Get the Meeting, um, it, they're filled with, with methods for breaking through and really a lot of answers to that same question. How do I break through? God, there are so many ways to do it. Right. You know, um, Some of my favorites are, because I, I, I really like the, the, uh, the idea of, of um, or the, let's say the platform of providing insight in what you do and doing it in an insightful way. One of the ones, one of the ones that really impresses me a lot is, is using visual metaphors. There are lots of ways to do that, but let, I'll give an, exa an example is, um, I don't know, do you know Don, uh, Dan Waldschmidt? No. 
No, okay. Dan's a, he's a really interesting guy to get to know. Uh, he writes the, the blog Edgy Conversations. <clears throat> it's a it's a highly ranked um, sales blog. Um, but really what he does as a profession is he's a turnaround specialist. So he, uh, you know, I mean, he, he, he helps companies turn around. If they, they've got a missed ending, earnings estimate, um, then they need something, they need help quickly or their stock's really going to plummet. So, so what he does, he has a really interesting way of reaching out to, to companies that are in trouble. He, he combs the news every morning for stories of missed earnings estimates. When he finds one, he has this beautiful sword made up. Um, you know, I have it on a table somewhere else in my studio, but he has this beautiful sword. And again, I can't make, my arms have to go out this far. You know, they're this big sword um, made by the prop maker who makes all the swords or made all the swords for the movie Gladiator. And he, so he has a sword made up, by the way, they're not sharpened. <laughs> they're not that dangerous. So he has the, the CEO's name engraved on the blade along with a, with an inscription, something like, if you're not, on, if you're not all in, you're not in at all. And that goes in this beautiful wooden box with a handwritten note that says, Hey, um, business is war. Business, sorry, business is war. And I noticed you lost a battle recently. I just want to let you know, if you ever need a few extra hands in battle, you know, we got your back. And Dan gets a hundred percent response rate to that so far. Now he doesn't need to be a cartoonist to do it. He just needs to order the, the sword, but the sword, we got to think about the sword for a moment. I don't want people saying, oh, okay, good. oh, I see what you do. You send swords. The sword is a visual metaphor. It's a visual communication of a bunch of things. One is it's a visual, it ties to his brand, edgy conversations. There's a nice edge to swords. Um, it ties to, um, well, let's say also the value that he wants to bring to the, to the CEO he's reached out to. We'll go to battle for you. We will go right in there with you and we'll, we'll go to battle. We'll swing the sword right along with you. So, um, so those, that, that's a great thing. Um, that really ties in well with what he wants to do, with the, the value he wants to offer and what his personal brand is. And by the way, you know, <clears throat> the, the, that, that note that goes with it, that it's handwritten and it's not on stationery and that there's no, there's no logos, people might think there's no branding happening, but there's lots of branding happening, right? I mean, right. It's, it, you know, Dan is the kind of guy who would do this. This guy's outrageous. This is yep. exactly who we need on our, on our team to turn this around. So that's, that would be one example of a, a visual metaphor, but there are lots. So um, how, maybe I missed it, I was taking notes here. How does he know that they lost a battle? And is that, is that adding salt to the wound? Uh, well, <clears throat> the way that he knows is again, he's, he's combing the business news every morning for stories business. of missed oh, yeah, yeah. earnings okay. estimates. So when he finds one, then he goes into action. Gotcha. So there's something happening there. And, and you know, the, he, you know, I interviewed him about it. He said, you know, these CEOs, when that happens, they're about the most lonely people in the world. Yeah. Suddenly no one wants to talk to them, I guess. But, but you know, turnaround specialists do need to connect with them. And, and they probably recognize it would be a good idea to bring in some help. Right. So I don't think so. I don't think so. I, you know, and the fact that he's getting 100%, he's getting through to 100% of these people says that um, they're open to, to talking. So I wouldn't say that the reaction is, are you kidding me? This is rubbing salt in the wood. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's the old adage too that, you know, whoever can spend the most money to acquire a customer is going to win. You know, because- You know, that might be true. Forward. What's that? That might be true. Yeah. I mean, because- well, actually, I don't, actually, no, I don't want to say that because there are also, there are free or nearly free ways of doing it, but you, you know, you just, there are, but yeah. man, if, if something this stinking big shows up at my doorstep, I'm like, big, hey, in, big impression. You got my attention. Yeah. Right. Versus, yeah. versus a thousand stupid LinkedIn messages. Uh, hi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or a postcard. This. I learned this by accident. There's a sales guy in England. Uh, he reached out to me a couple years ago and he had all these little logos and, and icons and stuff in his LinkedIn profile and his name. So I used one of them, a little red telephone, put it in my name. Well, what I've come to learn is when people use screen scraping tools and uh, things like that, it pulls in that icon. So when I get an email that says, Wes, red phone, comma, I know they scrape <laughs> that thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I can choose to ignore them. That's or funny. Not. Uh, and so I typically <laughs> accept, uh, you know, unless they're overseas, and you know, I get a lot of LED lighting. I didn't know that was so lucrative. You know, LED lighting manufacturers in China. <laughs> Why do they want to connect with me? But anyway, 
So I accept pretty much everybody, but I, I'm, there's no connection there. I, I literally, when I yeah. get one of those, I'll accept, I go to their profile and I click unfollow. So, all right, we're connected. I'll reach out to you if, if I need something, cause you reached out to me with a spam screen scraping tool. So, all right, it's a, yeah. we're all yeah. even. <laughs> but if they mail me a freaking <laughs> sword, or even a book, right? You've got books. I got my little red and white book back there. I mean, yeah. even people don't read it. I mean, hey, very few people read it. Very few read the whole thing. But yeah. they don't throw it away. It sits on their shelf. And we got a little bit of a little top of mind awareness. Yeah. Hey, books are great contact devices. And in fact, sometimes, I, you know, I don't want to keep touting my own books, but I hear from people who do this that they're saying that they send my book. Sure. You know, you can send somebody else's book. So you don't have to be an author either. But if you are, that really helps. Hey, um, it was, um, when was it? January 2011. Um, it was my first big keynote where I was paid real money. Um, and went to Vegas, about a 400 person conference. You know, it paid for travel and nice meals. Uh, and I didn't have a book. And so I got access to a kind of an out of print sales book back then uh, and got cases of them. And I sold $1,200 of someone else's book. I was signing someone else's book wow. after a conference. Oh, that's amazing. Making money. That's unbelievable. I didn't have a book at the time. So then, <laughs> you know, then I wrote a couple books, but you know, you yeah. can do that as well. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now you, you were saying a while ago, you said uh, that the person who spends the most is the one who's going to get the, get the, Meaning, the thing is, I was just remembering that trip last week that I slept in the car to make. So I ended up uh, meeting up with, with someone that I, I only knew through, uh, through LinkedIn. And it turns out, we, we sat and we had a great conversation. And he was saying, you know, we were thinking we might use our company jet as a contact device. I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yep. I would, you know, if you, if, you were, if you offered to fly me to Jackson Hole or something to go yep. have a meeting, I would go, <laughs> you know. Well, and pick me up in your plane. It, right? the company, no, that would be great. Yeah, they're they're spending money, right? That yeah, they are. Salesperson, the meals, whoever can spend the most money. Uh, and now those are big, big corporations. But yeah, you ever heard of a uh, Robert Ringer winning through intimidation? Oh man, yes, that was one of my favorite books. I loved this book, Audacity. Oh, Incredible man. Audacity. So he was flying around in a in a private jet, showing up with the staff. I mean, this is like I don't know, seventies. Yeah, maybe I mean, maybe the '60s. I don't know, but he was showing up with the staff, doing big like apartment deals. They'd have they carry their typewriters in and just sit there yeah. in the office and type it up and do a deal. Like whoa! And his and his contact device was his Learjet. He'd show up and have meetings in it and yeah. intimidate them. Yeah, it was yeah. great. I loved his book. Yeah. So he's spending money. To I hope he's water. listening. Yeah. <laughs> so you so you studied marketing right at, at yeah. USC. When did you learn to draw? Well, um, my contact with cartoons goes way back to when I was, uh, let's say a 10 year old kid. And I was, uh, well, you know, we used to, my brothers and I used to sneak playboys out of my father's dresser drawers. <laughs> and so, um, and we, of course, we did it to read the articles, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're great articles. Well, damn, let's get these out and read these articles. Actually, you know, we, we were looking at the pictures, but we were also, I was looking at the cartoons saying, who are these guys? How do they do this? You know, Gahan Wilson and Eldon Dadini and Michael Folks, and there were some great cartoonists in there. And um, then fast forward, when I started my business, I, I recruited a lot of my heroes of cartooning. And I started with Gahan. I mean, Gahan was, Gahan just passed away actually um, a couple of weeks ago, but he was, he was a, he became a friend and a colleague and a, and a mentor. It was incredible. It's like, a, you know, I, I got all these cartoonists who, who I, I grew up seeing their cartoons and then they become, became part of my marketing group and, I, and, and my mentors really and in cartooning. And, um, and so it was like, I was, I, in a way it was kind of like for my career, I was raised by wolves. It was one of those kids, you know, <laughs> um, great mentors. So it was always a parallel track. I was always, I was just doing it because I love to do it. I was, um, around the time when I graduated from USC, I, I was being published in one of the LA papers from time to time. And it just grew from there. It's just sort of, it's a parallel track in my career. So is it, um, 
Is it like a laborious process, like hours and days, you know, to make <laughs> one or, or is it like rapid fire, like make 10 or 20 and then and through the process, <laughs> one of them pops? Uh, it's well, I, I'd say it's more like the, the former. Um, so at least for me, anyway, I, it takes me a long time to come up with the ideas. Actually, they come up when I'm just about to fall asleep. Mm, a lot of times. Um, and then the drawings, I mean, Eldon Didini had said to me a long time ago that, I mean, here's some of that mentorship, but he said, you know, the trick here is that you want to make it look like it just, you just threw it, threw it together. Like you just jotted it down, just sketched it out real quickly and put some wash on it, black and white wash on it, done, called it done and put the caption under. But the fact is that you put a lot of time into them. Um, so even just, even just the drawing, once I'm, once I have the, I start with the idea, usually, um, some cartoonists start with just drawings and, and then they caption them later, but I start with the idea and then draw it out. And it, it, it takes at least how well, it takes days sometimes to come up with the ideas. I mean, whenever they, whenever they come up, I should say, I just write them down. So I keep them and then drawing them takes a few hours. Right. I think I want to record the process of it sometime for my vlog. Right. And is, this has always boggled my mind. It's like some of these are so detailed, you know, is it all in your head? Like you, you know the exact dimensions of a cowboy hat or a telephone or a desk, or will you look at a reference and kind of reference a, do a Google search for desk and oh yeah, okay, there's kind of how a desk looks to, to hone in on the, you know, on the shades and the dimensions. You know, I, well, I, lately I've been doing a lot, using a lot more reference than I had been. Um, I, I, I was just drawing them and I, and I wasn't, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know that I could speak for all cartoonists, but in my, in my experience, I was never really happy or ter terribly happy with the drawings. They, sh they could be better. They should be better. And then I, I, but I'd never been trained as an artist. So I took a couple of live um, figure sketch classes and so, you know, there's a model, usually they're nude, they're up there on a, on a stool and there's a whole bunch of you and you're drinking a little bit of wine, having cheese maybe, and, but you've got this easel and you got all these, you know, you got your pad up and you're drawing with charcoal, which is like so blunt. It's just, it's hard. You think, man, I can never get a detailed drawing out of this. But actually, so, and the, the teacher will have you do some sketches in 15 seconds. Those are like, you know, do it quickly. And others will take five or 10 minutes to, to get a lot more um, character and development out of it. And, um, and just those helped me a lot. From that point though, I, I said, okay, then I need re some reference material. So I do, I do use Google a lot just to say, okay, how does that look? And you know, I really wanna know how the, how the, the, the fabric falls on them. Right. I mean, you, those become pretty repetitive right. uh, things. And you might notice in cartoons that, well, certainly faces express a lot of of emotions, they're, they're, I mean, that's where we pick up expressions. But there's also <clears throat> there's also body language, and man, Leo Collin was one of, again one of those mentors, one of the people, one of the guys in my group, um, and I learned from him especially that hands really, this, the posing of hands actually can can express a lot. So you 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 work a lot of those things into these drawings because yeah. there's a there's a composition to it. You have to the eye has to be directed very quickly and, and, and you see the point of the cartoon. Right. Um, and that comes from practice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've been, uh, I think I'm finally getting on kicking my own butt to do something, but uh, do you know the diary of a wimpy kid series? I don't, I, I don't, man. I think I've seen something like it maybe, but I, I don't clearly you don't have young kids in the house anymore. No, not anymore. <laughs> but yeah, it's a huge series. Uh, it's, it's taken on a life of its own, multiple books, and they made movies. Um, Diary of a, of a Wimpy Kid. Yep. Okay. I think I, okay, I'm, I'm probably, I'm sure I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. But you've got to refresh my memory. Yeah, it's huge. And, and it's just simple, um, black and white, uh, you know, hollow character, right? Like not shaded in, just, you know, stick figure, I mean, more than a stick figure, but not much more. Yeah. Uh, but he's a wimpy kid, right? That, that has a higher um, uh, value or impression of himself than he really is. Right. <laughs> so it's, so I bought wimpy sales.com and I've, 
I'll jot nice. down little one and two panel things and I'll use uh comic. Um, oh, what the heck is it? I got one of these apps on my, on my iPad and, and, um, uh, Mac that'll, you can put an image in and it'll, it'll colorize it or whatever you I don't, I don't know the verbiage. Right. So, but I've been thinking about doing a, a sales book, you know, diary of a wimpy salesman. So just using the, the negatives to highlight the positives. Cause I feel like there's just yeah. so many sales every day. There's a new sales book out, you know, the new method and the A, B, C, G, Z method, you know, like, okay, dude, <laughs> how many methods can there really be yeah. to get somebody's attention? But I love comics and, and cartoons and illustrations. And, you know, I just, I do think they really pop and stand out. And um, so you know, I love getting yeah. the info from you. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> So you mentioned, so you've got, uh, you got a bunch of books out. I mean, I'm linking to a few uh, on the website. Um, one of the early ones I saw, Drawing Attention, How to Unleash the Incredible Power of Cartoons and Marketing, Advertising, Sales, Promotion, Job Search, Ooh, Boom. Job Search, VIP yeah. Contact Campaigns, and more. And then How to Get a Meeting, which you mentioned, How to Get a Meeting with Anyone, The Untapped Selling Power of Contact Marketing. And now yeah. your, your latest is coming out when? So, whoops, and I, I happen to have some of these. So this is the that's this is the latest one. Get the meeting. That one just came out in October. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't have drawing attention with me, but but here's the the original. How to get a meeting with anyone? Yep. Um, the drawing attention. You know, drawing attention came from from this when I was creating direct mail campaigns. Um, I was fighting some headwinds from David Ogilvy and you know these all these big thought leaders of the time who were saying humor doesn't work. It doesn't work in advertising, so so don't use it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so you know, but it does actually. It works really well. You right. just have to know how to use it. So um, you know, I ended up I ended up creating a lot of direct mail campaigns for a lot of big ma magazine publishers, essentially all of them. And, um, and, and so I ended up with millions and millions of dollars worth of test experience, utterly unique because it had to do with the use of cartoons in, in, um, in, in these direct marketing um, right. settings and, and, and missions. And so I thought, you know, I better put together a book about that. So that's direct, that's, that's drawing attention. And then finally, there's a book, there is one book of cartoons called Big Fat Beautiful Head. Got to, got to put one of those out every once in a while. Yep, I saw that too. All right, I'll link to that yeah. one as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, I was going to say, oh, where are my notes? Let me see. Yeah, the you know on humor. It's like I always tell people if if I if I talk more than five minutes, you'll hear me say something that's probably contradictory. Because on the one hand, I would beat up my my clients and say, don't use humor, uh, but you don't use humor at the moment the decision has to be made when the when when the stakes when it's high stakes when you've when you put the price out there uh, yeah. you know, the old adage whoever speaks first loses right when when you need to put the pressure on don't use humor because it's it relieves the tension and you got to start all over again you know, but do yeah. you use humor when you do yeah. want to cut the tension and, and ease things, you know, do you, do you have thoughts either way on those? Yeah, I think you're absolutely on the money because I mean, I use humor to open the door. I mean, cartoons are they're Well, I mentioned that, that they impart a, a piece of truth. They get a lot of, they get more attention than just about anything you could put in print or even on a screen. Right. Um, and, and they're also disarming. I mean, some of the cartoons that I send are about, hey, you're not calling me back. What's, what's going on, right? Yeah. But, they, but, it's, but it's so disarming that they're funny and, they're, and it just cuts the tension. It's exactly what you, how you put it. But the messages, the messaging that I put in with, with, I guess I think this is directly analogous. The messaging that goes with the cartoon is absolutely serious and down to business. Right. Because you can't just be a joker walking in. You've got to show that you, ha I mean, you've given an insight and that insight has triggered a, 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 an interest um, and a rapport and a, and a conversation. But from there, have a real conversation. Right. You know, don't keep cracking jokes. I mean, that's, yeah. that's rather silly. You don't want to come right. in being silly. Right. Um, so, yeah, there is a time to be funny and a time not to be funny. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. 
I, uh, I like that delineation. Very cool. So we have talked about a lot of things. Where should we send folks? Uh, I'm linking all of your books on the, on the show notes, but for those that are sleeping in their car, they're on a ferry, they're on a plane, right? And, yeah, uh, they have nothing to write anything down with. They're, they're jogging. <laughs> um, where should we send them? Well, I mean, so a couple of places. One, um, you, can, uh, you can find out a lot more about contact marketing, and there's a lot more to tell, actually. Um, on my, my site, my author site, that's stuheinick.com, S-T-U-H-E-I-N-E-C-K-E.com. Um, you can also, I have, a, I have a brand new vlog channel on YouTube that I'm really excited about because I'm, I'm, I'm shooting video. When I, when I go on meetings, I mean, we also have interviews with people to, to talk about how you get meetings and how they're getting meetings. But, but, um, but you know, the, some of the ones that I'm really excited about are, are the, 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 the episodes that I'm shooting. I just, I'm just shooting out the window with the plane and shooting the whole trip and showing that when you go on these trips, when you travel, you're going on a hell of an adventure, actually, if you look out the window. Right. I mean, I was just flying over the Sawtooths and the, the Rockies of Wyoming um, last week, and it was unbelievable. I mean, it was just so beautiful. So there's this whole adventure going on, and they're kind of music videos about the adventures of, of having meetings. And uh, so, that, so there is a, there, there's a, a, a um, YouTube channel that, that uh, you can look, look me up under and, and check out those videos as well. Very cool. Well, I am, uh, I've linked to that as well, linked to your Twitter, everything. So if y'all forget anything, just look Stu up on, uh, on this episode and you will find uh, where X marks the spot, right? Find the treasure. Find the treasure. There it is. Stu. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thanks for, uh, for making time. And, um, you know, if you're ever in SoCal, let me know. I will do that. And Wes, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Hey, it was my pleasure. Have a great day. Why business cards are inert. Actually, they're dead. Yeah. For the most part, I do agree with that. You can make some cool business cards. I've made uh, a business coin. Got the idea from Jeffrey Gittimer. I've had him on the podcast. But uh, those are expensive. Uh, they do People do keep those. Uh, but I do agree with the point, right? Most people are boring. I literally, yesterday, cleaning out my office. I told you I've been doing spring cleaning. But I'm doing it in January. I'm doing it digitally. I'm doing it physically. Um, threw out a bunch of old cards. Uh, but I did find a couple that I needed to get back in touch with. So we are all guilty of making some mistakes here and there in our businesses and our lives. But uh, you get the point, right? I, I love it's contact marketing. You know, direct marketing has never gone out of style. It has always been effective. Uh, yes, it's a little more expensive up front, but the ROI when you do it right is huge. Um, I love what he's doing with the deep personalization. Uh, the visual metaphors. So um, I love hearing how he brainstorms and thinks through things. Um, like I said, I've been sketching. I've got uh, the new iPad with the, the second generation pencil. I mean, I, I love it. So um, it's a nice thing of having your own podcast, right? You get to pick people's brain that you find interesting. So there you have it. Uh, and hey, let me remind you, the implementors.com. Come join us, the free Facebook group. Come ask any question, and uh, I'll do my best to help you there. And then the five, the five dot us, be the first one. All right, there is an alumni discount as well. Once you go through this, uh, I'm offering that for discounts on future programs and training. So you will lock that little bonus in as well. Okay, the five dot us. Thanks for listening. Don't go sell something.